Good morning. Is everybody doing well? Yes. Everybody get some good sleep last night? Yes. Wonderful, wonderful. Excellent. Well, like the, uh, the wonderful slide says, my name is Mark Johnson. Um, I am the uh, lead pastor of Crossroads Church in Oklahoma City. Uh, I'm, I will talk a little bit about my leadership journey uh, and my current context, my current frame. Um, it has been an interesting ride, to say the least, but um, we have been serving in, my wife and I, the, this capacity for uh, a total of four years as lead pastors, one year as interim, and then one year, uh, three years as the lead pastor. I've been in ministry, primarily youth ministry, for 15 plus years, so um, God is doing a work in our church, and uh, there is a need in not just the United States of America, but all over our world. Amen? Amen? There's a need for the gospel. There's a need for lives to be changed. And I think we need to stop. First thing we need to understand is as leaders of the gospel, we're not simply leading people to make better decisions. We're not leading people simply to be a part of a group or an organization, we are leading people to the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ. The Word of God says that when you, when you accept Jesus into your life as the Lord and Savior of your life, um, you are a new creation. That's what we're talking about, right? Yeah. We're talking about nothing less than the genesis of new creation, the genesis of new life, eternal life. Um, there are a lot of organizations that are good organizations in our world, but they only deal with earthly things. We as Christian leaders, we're dealing with eternal things. Because you need to understand, no matter you know, what car you drive, no matter what house you live in, no matter what watch you have on your wrist, um, all of those things, they all burn. You can't take them with you. The $5 million mansion and the shack by the river, all end up the same place. They all end up destroyed. The multi-million dollar automobile and the cheapest car you can buy will all end up in the junk heap on a long enough timeline. Everything on this earth is a consumable. Everything is consumed, even our bodies, is consumed and used up and does not make the transition into eternity. There's the one thing. That you can take, there's one thing you can take with you when you go to this next life, and that's somebody else. Amen? Amen. That's what it's all about. I'm going to talk to you about spiritually minded leadership. Spiritually minded leadership. I want to start off uh, by reading a, and we're going to unpack this. I'm going to talk about what this is, what it means to be a spiritually minded leader. And I will tell you, there is a great need for spiritually minded leadership. In our world, if you're going to lead your church, your, your ministry successfully, you need to be a spiritually minded leader. We're going to unpack what that means and um, what spiritually minded leadership looks like. I'm going to start with the passage here. Um, Acts chapter 15, very short one. But I'm going to unpack the context and, and, and let you know what it's all about. It simply says this, and this is the apostles that have met together, and they are writing letters to different churches, and these churches are being delivered to the churches uh, in the New Testament. Acts chapter 15, verse 28 says this, For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements. Now, this is a seemingly innocuous uh, verse. It's what I would call a flyover verse. Most people read it and say, oh, that's nice, and then they move on. However, this simple verse and simple statement given by the apostles gives rich and deep theological meaning. There are theological 
and leadership implications in this one passage that are so rich and deep, and you and I need to unearth these uh, wonderful implications and wonderful directives, and we need to live in them. What do I mean? Well, let's give you the context of why they're writing this passage. Uh, what's happening right now in the New Testament church is there's a group of teachers called the Judaizers that have come down from the north and they have started teaching uh, different teachings to the New Testament church. Um, in fact, uh, what they are saying and what they're teaching the New Testament church is that grace is not enough. Grace through faith is not enough. What you have to do and what they're teaching the New Testament church at this time is that you have to marry grace with Old Testament law. So you accept Jesus by grace through faith, but you also have to be circumcised as a Jew. You still also have to abide by all the Old Testament law um, along with faith. They're trying to marry traditional Jewish teaching with this wonderful new gospel of grace that has been introduced to the world. So they're saying that the cross is not enough to save, and it's not enough uh, for salvation. Now, this is the biggest threat to the New Testament church that they had seen. Um, bigger than the threat of persecution, bigger than anything else. This right here, the issue, the problem with the Judaizers, it could have completely changed the trajectory of church history as you and I know it. It was the biggest threat. It was huge. So what the apostles do, they gather together and they have a conference, kind of like this, I'm sure without the televisions, but they have a conference and they get together and they decide what are the things that we are going to require of our churches, what are the things that we're going to focus on and what are the things we're not going to focus on. So they write this, they draft this letter, and this is where, if you read in the book of Acts, and then you also read in uh, Paul's letters, where Paul and Peter have, have conflict, where Paul actually calls Peter out uh, because he's, he's, you know, playing buddy-buddy with, with the, some of the Judaizers, with some of the Jewish teachers. So this where we have this, there's, there's some conflict happening. There's, it's a big, you know, con convention and so they give this letter out, and the explanation, the reasoning, and I love this, the reasoning they give for their, um, uh, for, the, for this letter, shaping the future of church history is, it seemed good to us, and it seemed good to the Holy Spirit. That's it. That's, that's the reasoning they give. It seemed good to us, and it seemed good to the Holy Spirit, so this is what we're going to do. I mean, they didn't in, write the letter and say, the Lord doth spoketh to us on the mountain and the altar was burnt with fire and the Lord appeared to us. They, they, none of that. The Lord you know, appeared to us in mighty flame and said, this is what we are to do. They said, no, it seemed good to us and it seemed good to the Holy Spirit. Now, I don't know about you, but many times in my life, in my leadership journey, when I have to make some of the biggest decisions that I'm facing and I'm looking and I'm praying for direction, I'm praying for God to speak to me, I'm praying for the answer. Anybody ever been there? Yeah. Where you, sometimes you expect those big moments in the sky, those big the handwriting on the wall, you expect the miraculous and divine intervention of God. And so more often than not, all I have to go on is it seems good to us and it seems good to the Holy Spirit. This passage right here is the essence of spiritually minded leadership. We're talking about leadership that is grounded in number one, common sense. Common sense, good practices. Wise counsel, the word of God says that there is wisdom in a multitude of counsel. We have too many church leaders who don't have common sense. 
Are y'all with me? They have great and grandiose visions for God, but they don't know how to keep a balanced budget for their church, and they run their church in the red, and they spend all the money. Right? Pastors who are leading churches with people who are giving everything that they have. And they don't have money to barely eat, but they're giving money in faith to the church. And he turns around and he goes out and buys a, a Rolex with it. Wrong. Right? Because leadership in the church, you, the word of God says that the shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. God's calling us to be good shepherds of the people that he has entrusted to us. Because a good shepherd lays his life down for the sheep. He sacrifices himself for the sheep, but a bad shepherd, and you could read this in Ezekiel, uh, I believe, 33, chapter 33. A bad shepherd uses the resources of the sheep to make himself fat and rich. So leadership that is grounded and good, solid theology, good, solid doctrine, common sense, and it seemed good to the Holy Spirit. Leadership that is leans into and is led by the power and the presence and the leading of the Holy Spirit. We cannot, let me tell you this, you cannot do it on your own. You can't. You on your best day, your best leadership that you can bring to the table is not good enough because we're talking about eternal issues. You and I, we need the power of the Holy Spirit. So, um, I want to talk to you about being spiritual versus being mindful because I have found in my life, Christian leaders tend to fall into one of two camps. They're either very mindful, very logical, stubbornly stuck in common sense and logic, standing too firmly on their own understanding. They tend to deny the spirit and the moving of the supernatural. They tend to focus on tradition. They tend to question themselves out of every answer. You can question yourself out of every answer that God gives you. You pray for an answer. God gives you the answer. You say, oh, what about this? What about that? This leadership that is too mindful doesn't go anywhere. It's too afraid to move. It doesn't act in faith. Listen, without faith, it is impossible to please God. You need faith. If you pastor a church and you never come up with a circumstance to where you say, I don't know how to get this done. I don't know what I'm going to do. You might be pastoring wrong. Because it is impossible to please God without faith. Come on in, guys. It's all right. Come on in. It requires faith. So leaders tend to fall either into that category or the far too spiritual category. Now, I'm going to talk to you about my context a little bit. Okay? I grew up in the Assemblies of God, and I'm an Assembly of God pastor, so I'm a Pentecostal pastor. All right? Anybody familiar with Pentecostalism? Yes. Yes. Don't, I'll start shouting right now. Well, get the organ playing. Bah, 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 bah. Wah, bah, bah. That's me. I grew up. You know, some, some of y'all, listen. Yeah, yeah, listen, uh, and I, I know, and, and we all had different backgrounds. Some people grew up with, praise God from whom all blessings flow. Love that song. You know, great song. But it's so rigid, we don't do, you know, it's, that's just, that's, that's, that's home to you. You know, I get in there, yeah. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And I sing that, and I sing it that way, and you're like, mm, that speaks to my spirit. But me, it's I got a Holy Ghost shout coming on, bah, 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 and you just play that kind of stuff, and I'm, I'm at home, baby. You know, and Grandma's going to be running the aisles. So, so my context is I, I have seen far too many Pentecostal charismatic uh, evangelical leaders lead um, from this of being far too spiritual. And you say, wait, Pastor Mark, is there, is there such thing as being far too spiritual? Let me unpack that. Because they would call themselves far too spiritual, I would call them far too emotional. Because so often, people who are 
lean far too into spirit, the spiritual things, what they're really doing is leading into their own emotions. And they're leading from their own emotions and feelings. And listen, feelings are a horrible, horrible determiner of faith. Feelings should never lead our faith. Our faith should always lead our feelings. And our faith comes from the Word of God. Hearing what? The Word of God. Because the Word of God doesn't change. And when our faith is based on our feelings, what happens when our feelings change? But so often, people lead from what they feel like doing and what they feel in the moment And they are hiding behind the leading of the Holy Spirit and the leading of God. There are certain things that everybody is led to do. I have had people come to tell me. We've had outreaches through our church. Large outreaches to to reach the homeless, you know, population in Oklahoma Oklahoma City. And they've come to me and say, well, Pastor Mark, the Lord hasn't, he didn't speak to me and didn't lead me to help the homeless. And I say, oh, sweetie pie, let me talk to you. Yes, he did. Yes, he did. He, he's speaking to you and he's leading you through his word. Are you listening? You don't need divine revelation or God to speak to you on a cloud for you to help the homeless, the orphans and widows. The word of God says that in his word. So you and I are recipients of his word. So therefore, you and I are called to help the homeless and the poor, period. End of statement. Right? Right? Because the idea is we need to bring our feelings into alignment with his word. And what happens is this is where we, we have to find the balance. Because our, our mental pursuits, being mindful, helps to bring balance to, this, to our emotions. And the word of God is the foundation of it all. Are you all following me today? I will tell you this, listen, our world is looking for real, authentic power and authority. We are looking, the world is looking for for us to be different and to live different. Come on in, it's good. Let me be very honest with you, okay? Let Let me give you some statistics from Oklahoma, just from Oklahoma where I pastor, all right? The divorce rate in Oklahoma is 66%. That is the same for all the United States, okay? The divorce rate is about 60%. 60%. Here's the thing. There is zero difference between Christian divorce rate and non-Christian divorce rate. It's the exact same across the board in Oklahoma. Oklahoma is number one, the number one murder rate for domestic murder. That is, that is murder that occurs in the home between spouses. Number one in, this, in the nation. We are number two in the divorce rate as far as state, state for state. That's number two, the second highest divorce rate. And we are number three in domestic violence. And what we have happening is we have Christians, we have churches. And listen, Oklahoma, we're the Bible Belt, baby. You can't throw a rock without hitting a megachurch. I mean, us in Texas, we have so many churches, it's crazy. We have churches coming out our ears. And so you have churches and Christians going to the world and saying, hey, you should live like us. And they're saying, no, we see how you live. And it's no different than us. So, So why would I want that? We've got to live with authentic spiritual power and authority everywhere Jesus went they were in awe because he spoke as one with authority so there is a place to find this balance let me talk very personally why this is important in 2018 January 2018 I was serving as an executive pastor at Crossroads Church where I serve as the lead pastor The senior pastor, the man who hired me, called me into his office. And we had just, I just transitioned to being the executive pastor. I was overseeing the discipleship in all the ministries from birth through college. So I had a youth pastor underneath me, a children's pastor underneath me, 
We were looking to hire a college pastor to be underneath me, and I was going to oversee all of that. I was happy. It was good. Things, things, life was good, okay? So he calls me in his office, and he says, Mark, I need to talk to you. I said, okay. He said, are you looking to be a senior pastor? Are you talking to other churches? Are you about to leave? The question floored me. I said, no, we just, you just promoted me. I'm not going anywhere. Are you sure? Because I really... I think you're talking to other churches. I said, trust me, I'm not talking to any other churches. He said, okay. He said, I I just need to know it because if you are, I understand it. I get it. That's how ministry goes. Sometimes you get called away. But I just, he said, "I I feel the Holy Spirit speak to me and keep speaking to me something about you and lead pastoring. I said, well, it's not really on my radar right now, but okay, thank you. Okay, we good? We good? Okay. Literally within one month, he had stepped down from the church. He had resigned his position uh, in a a very, very, very tough departure. It was was really bad. And the church had asked me to step in as the interim pastor. I did not want to. I had no desire for it. But the Lord, he... He stopped me in my tracks and spoke to my heart and said, you need to do this. And I obeyed. I obeyed. And it has started me on this this journey. Um, It has been crazy. Uh, When the senior pastor stepped down, uh, he stepped down amidst some, it was nothing moral or anything like that. It had to do with money in the buildings. Um, some controversy, some, he was wanting to do one thing with the building and the church didn't want to do that with the building. And um, people got upset as people do. And so he resigned, he resigned. And, uh, um, with that about 200 to 250 people in our church left within the matter of a couple weeks. Um, then the entire pastoral staff departed all within a couple months. They were gone. I am the only pastor who is still on staff at Crossroads Church that I served with. I became uh, kind of America's most wanted. People that I served because I stayed, people I served with, my friends, people I was in the trenches with, I prayed with, I cried with, I bled with, uh, decided that I was, I was persona non grata. Um, they wanted nothing to do with me. Um, and we were six months away from bankruptcy. Six months away from bankruptcy. Um, Because when 250 people left, uh, so did all of their giving and contributions. Um, And since then, I have been uh, been yelled at. I have been called a liar. I have been called a thief. I've been called all kinds of things. And that's just from our church elders. (laughs) It was a a crazy situation um, that, that I was in. The church I serve in is a, was one of the first mega churches in the United States. Um, in the early 70s, and uh, we have a facility of over 200,000 square feet, and that seats about 3,500 people, and we were six months away from bankruptcy. But God is good. God is faithful. I realized in that moment that this leadership journey would take every ounce of intelligence and skill, everything that my mind had to off bring to the table, it would require that, plus it would, re- would require more. It would require spiritually intelligent, Holy Spirit dependent, Word of God trusting, Bible believing leadership at a higher level. This is what it takes. We need to understand, I often make a joke, ministry is a four letter word, W-O-R-K. Work. If you're not willing to work, then God will not bless. We have to be willing to put in the work. Let me talk about the spiritually minded leader. I'm going to try to get through this pretty quick because I want to uh, leave some time for some questions. Um, I love this passage here. Very simple passage. Luke 2.52. And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and in favor with both God and man. Wisdom, stature, favor with both God and man. These are what I would consider for the four pillars of spiritually minded leadership. I think this is interesting because all of these pillars 
Um, if you look in the business world, if you look in the organizational framework, these are all buzz topics, highly touted and sought after topics within corporate leadership around the world. I mean, you're talking uh, um, Fortune 500 companies, some of the largest corporations are investing millions of dollars into the four pillars that are listed right here in the Word of God. There is nothing new under the sun. And it is very, I find it amusing that the corporate world is finally waking up recently to leadership principles that have been in the Bible and that has God laid out. Listen, our God is a God of principles. And if we live out the principles, if we do what God has asked us to do, if we obey, then he will bless. And uh, so let's talk about these four pillars, okay, in the spiritually minded leader. Number one, he grew in stature. Our physicality, we have got to take care of our bodies. Now, let's get real. As you can see, there is not a food that I don't like. Right? But I am on a journey. I have lost 60 pounds. I was a much larger mark not too long ago. And I've been on a journey for a little over a year to, uh, to get healthier. Why? So I can look better in a swimsuit? No, baby, that, those days are long gone. <laughs> I'm married and four kids. I could care less what other people think about me, you know, how I look. But I noticed in this uh, process that ministry, listen to me, will take a toll on your physical body. And I noticed that my health was starting to interfere with my ability to minister to people. And when the stress of everything, the, the building, taking care of everything, dealing with congregation members who were, who were scared to death, didn't know what was going on, other congregation members who were angry, they were angry at the pastor, and because he was no longer there, they turned their anger and their venom on me because I was a pastor. And here's the thing, you need to understand that. There are people who will point and, and they, will, they will direct their venom at you because they are mad at, at somebody else. And just because you're not the pastor, just because you're a pastor, they will direct that at you. It's tough. Even Jesus went through this when he talks to the crowd and says, you must eat my body and drink my blood. And a multitude of people leave. And he looks to the men, the 12 men, the named disciples that he loves so much and he looks at them, and in that moment, he looks and says, are you going to leave too? Everybody else has left. Are you going to leave too? You've got to take care of your body. You've got to take care of your body. And my, I noticed my health was hindering my effectiveness in ministry. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19. Oop, did I not have it? Oh, don't have it up there. Sorry. But 1 Corinthians 6, 19 through 20 says, um, Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you are bought with a price. So glorify God with your body. And we're learning this in, in the church world. You know, we used to love to, once again, I grew up old-time Pentecostal, so we used to love, you know, people used to love preach about that on, you know, uh, Alcohol, tobacco, old time preachers stand up and say, I don't smoke, I don't chew, and I don't date girls that do, you know. It's great. Put down the fried chicken. <laughs> Put down the double whopper, you know. Am I right? We have to take care of our bodies. So, second thing, he grew in stature, he took care of his body. Second thing we see oh, is um, wisdom. He grew in wisdom. I've often heard it said that church leadership is the single hardest leadership task there is because you're dealing with volunteers. You're dealing with people who could leave and go at any time. And you and I know as church leaders that when you have a job, if I have a job and I'm paid to be there, there's the expectation that I show up. And if I don't show up, somebody's going to call me and say, hey, where are you? Right? Right? But when you're dealing with volunteers, you know, and I could tell them, well, I felt like going to the, to the lake today. I just kind of felt like 
taking a day off and I, I didn't feel like I had to tell anybody. I just felt like, you know, I needed a break today. Many of you know that if I, you told that to your, your boss or your manager, they would say, that's great. You don't feel like, don't, don't come in tomorrow. You're good. <laughs> we'll find somebody else who wants to come in. But in the church, right? I felt like going to the lake today. It's volunteers. We're talking with, with volunteers. So you have to motivate your volunteers, and you have to offer them something because you, you, it's something bigger than a paycheck. Because that's what we, we're, we're dealing with. We're dealing with salvation. And you've got to motivate people. And you need to do it with the Spirit. Not manipulation, but with the Spirit. Being, leading people. Um, wisdom. We have, need to understand. Leaders are learners. How many books are you reading? How many books have you read this year so far? And we need to constantly be learning. Constantly educating ourselves. When I stepped into this position um, I have a bachelor's degree in uh, biblical studies. So I've learned, you know, Greek, Hebrew, all that good stuff. Um, but when I stepped into the position as lead pastor, I realized that I was uh, grossly underqualified in regards to the business, the operation of the church. So I enrolled and actually just completed not too long ago my master's degree in organizational leadership. And uh, my, my elders asked me, they said, why are, you, why are you not going to a seminary? In fact, I'm just enrolling to get my doctors in, uh, in a seminary. But they said, why aren't you getting more biblical education? I said, because this is a big organization, and it requires organizational leadership to handle this. We're, we were six months away from bankruptcy. We got to make sure that we keep our books correct. We need ethical and sound leadership. So I noticed that lacking in my uh, leadership toolbox. So you have to constantly be learning. How are you learning? How are you investing in yourself? How are you gaining the skills that you need to gain wisdom? All wisdom comes from God. But we need to be educating ourselves. You will never lead people where you've not already gone. And here's the thing. Don't just listen to other preachers. Let me give you a, a suggestion here. Number one, listen to business experts, organizational experts, media design experts, uh, organizational framing experts. Uh, one of the best podcasts on this is the Andy Stanley Leadership Podcast because um, he, uh, he interviews people who run multi-million dollar corporations. And the, and the crazy thing is, like I said, the stuff that, that they're teaching, their high-level executives is Biblical principles. It's, it's crazy. Biblical principles. Um, so wisdom. Third one. Uh, favor with man. Emotional intelligence. Emotional intelligence. An emotionally intelligent leader recognizes what's, that the best idea doesn't always have to be his or her idea. One of the, the biggest... Leadership uh, trends right now is the development in emotional intelligence. In fact, uh, a lot of research shows that the biggest factor on an executive's trajectory and how much success they gain in the business world is their emotional intelligence. And I, once again, it's so funny that the business world is finally catching on to this. When this is, this is a church principle, emotional intelligence, being emotionally intelligent we need more emotionally intelligent leaders in our church. Pride has no business in the pulpit. Self-ambition self has no business in the pulpit. Y'all following me? Y'all with me? Emotional intelligence is the ability to recognize and respond to other people's emotional bids and emotional exchanges. Where they are at emotionally. We need to understand when we deal with our people, I have a saying that this is always about that. Okay? Let me give you a, let me give you a funny, fun example, okay? Or a kind of goofy example. Uh, has anybody ever heard a congregation member say, I'm, I'm not being fed at that church? You know what that means? I don't like you preaching. That's what that means. Because <laughs> we're preaching from the same Bible. This is always about that. Or normally what it means is you've said something to upset me and now I can't listen to your preaching. So underneath all of that, this, you know, I'm not being fed, I just, no, you've been hurt, 
And as leaders, we need to be emotionally intelligent enough to understand that there's people who are hurting and they need ministry. They need pastoring. Um, there's a reason why we're shepherds. To take care of the sheep, to take care of the flock. Even when they don't and can't recognize and take care of themselves. Y'all with me? Okay. Um, it's also emotional intelligence is the ability to lead yourself and lead your own emotions. We need to stop reacting to things and start responding to things. Reactions are when I just say whatever I'm feeling in the moment as I react to whatever you tell me, whatever your emotional bid or ex emotional exchange is. But a response is I'm going to stop. I'm going to be mindful. I'm going to think about it. I'm going to pray about it. I'm going to seek godly counsel, and then I will respond, an intentional and loving response. Um, okay, let me, let me continue on here. Favor with God. Spiritual intelligence. Spiritual intelligence. We've all heard of IQ. Many of us have heard of emotional intelligence or EQ, and I'm guessing not too many of us have heard of this phrase or, the, or SQ. Um, spiritual intelligence, recognizing when the spirit is moving, when the re recognizing when the spirit is speaking to you. The word of God says, my sheep recognize my voice. We'll never recognize the voice of God if we don't train our ears to hear the voice of God. 1 Corinthians 1.27 says, the spirit uses the foolish things to confound the wise. There is a spiritual wisdom that doesn't make earthly sense at times. But we've got to be willing to lean into that. Romans eleven twenty nine 29 says, For the gifts and the calling of God are without repentance. The gifts of God, the spiritual gifts manifest in our lives are without repentance. People are looking for a church that is full of the power of God. Let me tell you, I've, 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 loved, I've served God for many, many years. Okay. I have never once argued anybody into the kingdom of heaven. Never once. I've never entered into an intellectual debate and argued them to a place of salvation. Doesn't, it doesn't work. You know what works? Gifts and manifestations of the power of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit moving in your life. No man can come to the Father unless what? The Holy Spirit draws him. The drawing of the Holy Spirit as I give love, unconditional love to those people and listen to them and talk to them and love them and let the Holy Spirit move through me. That's what draws them in. Not me walking up to them saying, you know you're wrong and here's why you're wrong. But it's through love. They will know we're Christians what? That we love one another. In fact, if you look at the, the ministry paradigm of Paul, Anytime he goes into a new city, what does he do? He goes and he prays for a miracle. And a miracle takes place. He performs a miracle through the power of God, and that, open, that brings the guard down for the people, and then he starts teaching. I encourage you as pastors to pray for the Holy Spirit to move in your life, to be filled with the Holy Spirit daily. Holy Spirit, move. Holy Spirit, move in my life. We, we need the power of God. I mean, listen, what, what's the point of why do we even pray if we don't believe anything's going to happen? I believe in the miraculous. I believe that God heals people today. I believe that God can perform miracles. So let's believe that. Let's believe it. And I know there's a question, well, Pastor, well, what if you pray for a miracle and it doesn't happen? Listen, if I'm going to miss, I'm going to step up to the plate and I'm going to miss swinging for the fences. If I'm going to strike out, I'm going to strike out swinging for the fences. Y'all with me? I'm going to believe for a miracle. And if God, so what if God doesn't heal him? What if he does? What if that person is healed? What then? Imagine what God can do through you when somebody's walls are broken or are, are brought down because of the miraculous that happens, because of the Spirit moving, leaning into the Spirit. Uh, let me give you another quick example. As a young youth pastor, 
<laughs> I was a young youth pastor, and we had uh, two, two kids. I mean, you're talking 13 years of age, right? 13 years of age. Both grew up at the church. Everybody loved him. He was a sweet kid. She was a sweet little girl. They date everybody in the church thought it was just as cute as apple pie that they were dating. And we're on a youth trip, and they were, you know, very cordial. They were very respectful young kids, grew up in church, knew how to act. And the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart and said, there's something wrong. There's something wrong there. Something bad. No, there's not. Look at them. They're precious. Look at them. Just put them in your pocket, and you know, and they're just so cute. No, something's wrong. You need to talk to their parents. No, no. I'm not gonna. You need to talk to your par- their parents. So I called both their parents in for a meeting and said, listen, guys. I just, I feel I got to tell you this. There's something going on with, with your kids. And they looked at me and they laughed. Oh, Pastor Mark, we appreciate your concern so much. Oh, <laughs> you're precious. We want to put you in our pocket and carry you around. No, no, there's nothing going on. Trust me. I said, oh, okay, I believe you, but you need to watch. You just need to be prayerful and you need to watch. You need to watch. Okay, you're precious. Two months go by. The same two set of parents are in my office again, weeping and crying because of a pregnancy scare with their 13-year-old daughter, and they're debating on whether or not to have an abortion because the boy was sneaking out of his house in the middle of the night, getting on his bicycle, 13-year-old boy, driving, riding three, four miles to her house, knocking on her window, sneaking in, and they were sleeping together. While both sets of parents were in bed, he was sneaking out of the window and going back home before dawn. I had no, there was nothing, there was no earthly clue that was given to me that there's something going on. Only the prompting of the Holy Spirit. And because they were watching, um, it was, they were able to stave off a far worse thing because it would have just kept going on and on and on. Because they were watching, they caught him. So, and it, she ended up not being pregnant. It was good. There was no abortion. That was, you know, semi-positive ending to that. But um, I'm going to talk quickly about uh, leading spiritually minded. Being a spiritual, how do we lead spiritually minded? Um, you got to cultivate, you got to mind your seas. You got to mind your seas, okay? Mind your seas. I want to give you some thoughts just to think about. If you look at Jesus' ministry in the gospel, everywhere he went, he did three things. When he engaged with people, everywhere Jesus went, he did three things. Number one, he counseled people. Emotional intelligence. Okay? He counseled people. Number two, he confronted people. Intellectual intelligence. He confronted people. He counseled people who were lost, who were uh, in sin, and who were confused. He counseled them. He confronted religious leaders and hypocrites. And the third thing he did was he cast out. He cast out demon and demonic forces. Everywhere Jesus went, he had to cast out forces. If Jesus had to do that everywhere he went, why in the world do we think we get a pass? For the word of God says, for do not uh, wrestle against flesh and blood, but powers and principalities of darkness. Now, once again, I come from a Pentecostal background, right? So we, we, we get all into this. I mean, I get some, you know, we, we try to cast demons out of chairs and light bulbs and all kinds of stuff. I mean, I'm not getting into all that stuff. But you and I need to realize that there are spiritual realities that exist beyond our eyeballs. There are spiritual realities. Fear is not a mental state. Fear is a what? Spirit. Fear is a spirit. You cannot outthink and outsmart fear. Because you have to do battle in the spiritual realm against fear. Peace. You cannot think your way to greater peace in your life. Because peace is a spirit. It's fruit of the spirit. And the fruit of the spirit is love. So peace comes through love. And it's, God gives us peace that what? Passes what? All understanding. Yeah. And this is why Christians can be full of peace when there's nothing mentally that says, hey, you should be having peace right now. I know mentally things are crazy, but I've got peace in the middle of my storm. Why? Because peace doesn't come from my mind. Peace comes from the Spirit of God. 
Amen? Amen. And here's where we get, he counseled, he confronted, and he cast out. And here's the, here's the problem. Here's our, here's our problem. Um, we tend to cast out what should be confronted. We tend to cast out what should be confronted. We confront what should be counseled, and we counsel what should be cast out. You can't counsel spiritual darkness. You got to cast it out. All right? And so often what we do is we have people who come in our churches who are hurt and broken. What do we do? We cast them out. You're too much trouble. Get out of here. We don't want you. Get out of here. All right? They need counseling. But then we have people in our church who Satan is operating through. They may not even know it, but, but there is spiritual stuff going on. And we say, oh, we got to talk about it. we got to talk about it. No, you counsel the person. You cast out the spirit. All right? I'm not talking about de- demonic possession or anything like that. But I'm talking about praying, doing spiritual warfare. Right? There's fear happening. There's fear in, our, in this nation right now. That's a spirit. And we can sit and we can argue with each other on Facebook all day long about who's right and who's wrong. We can think about it all we want, but we need to pray against the spirit of fear and anxiety that is attacking our nation. We tend to cast out what should be confronted. We confront what should be counseled, and we counsel what should be cast out. So let me conclude here. Let me wrap this up. I'm actually doing all right on time, so I'm feeling good. Once again, Pentecostal. I, I could be here all day long. I'll be here till the chicken goes cold. So, all right. Nehemiah chapter 4, verse 17 says this. Uh, who were building on the wall, those who carried burdens, were loaded in such a way that each labored on the work with one hand and held his weapon on the other. This is a call for spiritual leaders who are willing to build and battle. Build and battle. We build people up. We do battle in the heavenlies. We build the church. We build the kingdom. And we battle the forces of darkness. We've got to be willing. And this, this is, in summation, the essence of spiritually minded leadership. You build. It's gonna, building his kingdom is going to take everything that you have physically and everything that you have intellectually. It's going to take everything. And you guys know this, right? But you have to constantly be developing that. Are you learning? As you, are you growing as a leader? But it can't be just that. It can't be just human and physical growth. We've got to grow in the spirit. We've got to lean into the spirit. When you're teaching the word of God, are you praying that the Holy Spirit will move through your teaching and empower your teaching? I will tell you, preaching is one of the, uh, next to salvation, it's probably one of the most amazing miracles that you could, that happens to man. I mean, think about it. Think about it. Um, you know, there are people who stand up and talk for a living, and they do a, they do a good job. There are comedians who are hilariously funny, engaging, entertaining. But I listen to it, but none of those people are going to change my life. I can listen to TED Talks, but it's not going to change my life. And you think about the concept of, hey, you sit in a room, and you're going to listen to somebody talk for 40 minutes. Really? No thanks. You know? I would rather go sit and watch a group of grown men kick a ball down a field, right? We call it soccer <laughs> or football. But, um, but, but something happens spiritually that when somebody like me stands up here or like you stands up behind a pulpit and not, doesn't just speak but preaches the word of God, there's something that takes place in the spiritual realm. There's power that gets imbued with those words and words that other people, great orators and great speakers would normally speak and, and it's okay and it just, you know, you listen to it now that's great and then you ignore it or it just kind of sloughs off your life. Somehow something happens when those words are spoken and they travel through the air and they hit the ears they then travel not just to the head, but the most important 18 inches of your life, from your head to your heart. 
And it's the words that God gives us has the, the ability through his spirit to change lives. It's a miracle. The act of preaching the word of God is a miracle in itself. We should never take that lightly. So when you prepare your messages, are you doing everything that you can to um, mentally prepare, to do the research, to do the study, but then are you doing everything that you can to be prayerful? To say, Holy Spirit, I've done everything that I can, but I need you to come in and, and move in a mighty way so that lives can be changed. Building and battling. The church and the leader who is willing to do this, to build and battle, will be a force to be reckoned with. I'm going to pray over you, and then I'm going to open it up. If anybody has any questions for the last couple minutes, um, then I'll be happy to do my best to, to answer them as best I can. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for every leader in this room. I thank you for the uh, calling on their life. I thank you for their giftings. I thank you um, for their passion. And I pray that um, each one of us would be spiritually minded leaders, developing ourselves intellectually, uh, developing those leadership skills, those interpersonal skills that we need to engage people on a, on a more efficient and better level. But also, I pray that we would lean into your spirit. That for us, when we, we read the word of God and teach the word of God, it would not just be an academic exercise, but it would be an exercise of the spirit. And that as each one of these leaders um, speaks your word and speaks, preaches that their words would be imbued and empowered with your Holy Spirit and it would pierce people's hearts and they would realize that they can become new in you, new creations. I pray that we'd be brave enough, brave enough to be spiritually minded leaders and to lead the people that you have entrusted us with well. We thank you for all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.